I'd like to thank you again for joining us as we uh, take a look at the restoration movement here in America and kind of working our way through some of the uh, different works that were involved. And certainly we are so grateful and appreciative to the many preachers that were a part of this historic uh, event and uh, the shaping of America in the way of, of religion and uh, the work that all of these different preachers took upon themselves to try to get people out of denominationalism and back to New Testament thinking, trying you know influencing different individuals with you know through their preaching and their teaching and and trying to get you know to restore the integrity of of, of the scriptural foundation, the authority of the scriptures as it has been revealed by God. Uh, last class, we took a look at uh, the work of Alexander Campbell, and this was a preacher that has been so instrumental in uh, the restoration movement here in the States, and uh, sometimes he gets more recognition than he might deserve. Uh, many people really elevate him to a place that you know none of these men wanted to be, and Campbell was, uh, you know, his, his premise, the cause of everything he was trying to do was to was to try to get people to see the glory of what what Christ has established in his scripture and the New Testament way of thinking. Um, we took a look at a lot of his work in the last class and in this class we're going to be looking at uh, the influences of Alexander Campbell. In other words, those men who uh, had a great impact on his life. You know, we're all we're so grateful for the men and the women who have helped uh, shape our spiritual lives in the past. And some of it has been in person, and we're certainly grateful for those who've taken time out to uh, to be with us, to sit with us, to pray with us, to study with us. And I think each person has that one individual in their life, or uh, maybe numerous individuals who, you know, who've really helped kind of shape your spiritual journey or help, you know, direct us in, in different ways that we go. And uh, sometimes it's not in person. It's uh, the work that we're able to read, whether it's through books or or listening to different lessons or sermons or uh, just you know reading articles uh, you know people have a great in impact on our lives and a great influence on our lives through what we're able to read and study with their uh, with their work and such was the case with Campbell a lot of men you know helped in influence the thinking of Alexander Campbell and you know as, and were very instrumental in in helping him as he you know as he comes over and tries to get people to look back to New Testament thinking, different ideas that uh, he took and he and, and he really shaped it and utilized these different ideas in his teaching and preaching, and it helped him along the way to help others as well. And so we're going to take a look at some of these men that were in Alexander Campbell's life. And, certainly, and what I would like to do along the way here as well is, while we look at these different men that helped shape his life, keep in mind that people have helped shape yours. Uh, we're going to be looking at some of the historical events that uh, Campbell was a part of and, and why these men were so significant in his work and helped grounding him in a lot of these different principles and these fundamental ideas. And so And so as we go along, uh, you know, to, uh, to, to help us uh, understand better the whole purpose of what this movement was. We'll take a look at you know some of these different figures and make application of to for how it helps us today and how it can help us understand and uh, and motivate us to help other people and just to keep the the authority of Scripture alive and keep it at the very center of who we are as a people, as God's people. The first one that uh, Campbell was influenced by, and of course there are you know numerous, and there are probably even more than what we're going to be looking at today. But for time's sake, we'll we'll hold it down to um, the number that we have. First one is a man named uh, Dougal Stewart. In 1808, Campbell uh, studied under Stewart at uh, Glasgow University, and of course, uh, you know Alexander Campbell came over to America from Scotland. Uh, he and his father both, who was uh, Thomas Campbell, came over just within just a few years of each other. But Campbell, uh, you know, he studies at Glasgow University under Stewart. Uh, Stewart was a professor of philosophy. And when you look at Campbell's work and a lot of his writings and when you study his debates, you, you know, you really understand how, you know, the, the impact that philosophy had on the way that he taught. He was very scholarly. He was very, you know, everything was really meticulous with the way he presented it. Um, he studied a place of he studied the place of imagination in our cognitive 
abilities. And so, you know, there was a lot of psychology that was involved with it. And that helped him really try to reason uh, with other people who were of a uh, scholarly sort as well. Remember, when Campbell would go into a debate, he would want to find the person at the very top of their particular field and debate them. And he and the way to succeed in doing that is to, you know, to bring the psychology into it and to uh, really exaggerate the uh, or you know to emphasize the uh, the psychological parts of philosophy of different religions and understandings. Um, Campbell's view of the imagination was that it was something taught, that it was, you know, that it was put in us by God. And so he takes a, you know, he takes a course during this time of logic and philosophy. Uh, his father, Thomas, studied a lot of the same philosophers that he did. And so, uh, you know, a lot of these men made a great impact on both uh, Alexander and Thomas through their preaching. And so they were, it, you know, I think it helped enable them by the time they got over here to uh, really help shape uh, the movement that was at hand. Of course, neither one of them saw it as a movement at first. Now, later on, that would change, and we're going to look at that in just a little bit here. Uh, Campbell, you know, started to think of it as his movement, and uh, certainly he was important to it, but he wasn't the only one who was involved with it. Uh, Dougal Stewart was a uh, student, uh, though, of a man named Thomas Reed. Uh, Thomas Reed was the father of common sense philosophy. I think you've ever studied that. And his teaching uh, affected a lot of Campbell's thinking. And so, you know, a lot of this, this philosophy, the, you know, the uh, psychology of it, the, you know, the deep thinking was a very, was very significant. It was very relevant to the teachings of Campbell. And so we have, to, you know, we have Stuart and we have Reed who were who made a, a great impact on his life. Another man who made a great uh, a great impact on him, and and uh, really helped you know kind of push him along. Uh, of sorts is a man named John Locke. John Locke was a uh, philosopher who influenced Campbell, and he would read a lot of his teachings and, and a lot of his philosophies. And Locke was a contemporary of Reed's. Now, John Locke is probably, if you're familiar with American history, was uh, you know his name comes up a lot in in history books as he. Uh, Helped shape a lot of the uh, the presidents and had a great uh, had a great influence on the shaping of the country itself. Um, but he was a contemporary of Reed's, and when Campbell debated Owen, remember he debates Owen on the subject of atheism. And when he and when when he debates him on this subject, he used a lot of Locke's philosophy. Locke wrote a book back in 1660 called the reason the reasonableness of Christianity. And he, you know, so he influenced a lot of the founding fathers of America uh, through this kind of, through the, this kind of uh, reasoning. And you know, when you go to the Washington D.C. or when you look on, on a lot of the documents, when you read through the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, just you know, certain documents that are very uh, significant, that are very monumental in this country. That helped give us our personality. That you know, that really kind of gave America its legs. Um, and, and as she progressed and developed, uh, we see a lot of this kind of teaching that, you know, with uh, shaping it in, under the, you know, the confines of God and, and the boundaries of religious thinking. And of course, you know, you've probably heard someone say that, you know, this, this country was founded on Judeo-Christian principles. And while it's not New Testament principles uh, per se, there are a lot of uh, morals and ethics that do come from Christian thinking and from uh, come from the Bible that are, were you know that were injected into uh, the establishment of this country and a lot of this is thanks to John Locke and what he did and the influence that he had on this country and and certainly the uh, you, you know the, uh, the the relationship and the, the the impact that he had on the founding fathers Locke was a Puritan in his day and uh, Reed believed that we come from, you know, the tabula rasa. There, so there's a little bit think, different thinking in Reed's. Uh, Reed thought that, you know, we're just kind of this white sheet and then everything starts to fill in all of the blanks in our in life. Um, Locke was, did not take that approach. Uh, he says that all, inf he believed that all inf information that we receive is from the outside in. And that is the, that that's the position that Campbell would ultimately take, that we could learn from the outside in. Campbell was 
being taught natural religion at Glasgow University, and he takes Locke's idea about learning from the, from the outside in, and he really starts to develop it. He really starts to hone in on that and expand it with a lot of his teaching and a lot of his writings as well. He really loved that idea of, you know, that we are that we can learn from the outside in about our religious history. Um, what I mean by that is that, you know, he said that the Campbell said that there's another way of learning and that is through our historical knowledge. Um, you know, that knowledge of God and of Christ comes from history. And that historical knowledge is every bit as valuable and strong as sensory knowledge. And so, you know, as we look at this, it's, you know, it's, it's very plain to see, you know, as we look at our religious history, and especially when we look at Christian evidences, and when we start to build cases for the existence of God, uh, for Christ and his existence, for the resurrection, and, you know, we start looking at uh, that first century and what it was, and you know why it was true, and why it can be trusted, uh, whether you're inside or outside of religion, whether you're in, inside or outside of the uh, kingdom of God, uh, there is evidence that is very sufficient for it. Now, the you know the probably the most effective uh, reasoning and the effective and the most effective evidence comes by the way of eyewitness testimony. But we know that we don't always have that, and especially today. Uh, we ha we have the cases, we have writings of these eyewitnesses for it, but we also need to understand that circumstantial evidence, that is, you know, whatever is not eyewitness testimony, is can be just as valuable as the eyewitness accounts, and that is what Campbell was hitting on when he, you know, when he started to really uh, expand on Locke's thinking that he, we can learn historically from the outside in that there is history that proves the existence of God. There is history that can prove the existence of Christ and that the church is what he said it was. And, you know, these, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that we can go back and read and understand about the, the Christian faith. Uh, I want to just uh, take a little bit here of, you know, to, to kind of show you, you know, especially in that first century and just, just beyond that first century, some of the history that we can do. We get this in the way of a couple in a few different uh, mediums. The first one is by these apostolic fathers. This is, you know, and the reason why I'm doing this is just as Alexander Campbell, while he was influenced by those who are immediately or probably closer to him uh, in time with their writings and so forth, he was like, you know, he was still able to look back and understand that there historically was so much evidence for God, so much evidence for the New Testament. And that is what he really that, that's where he really tried to hone in on, on getting other people to understand. And it's the same thing that we can understand as well. Now, we don't need to go outside of the Bible. We can trust our Bibles historically. Uh, we know that it shapes and builds and our faith and really helps us to develop our understanding of what God wants us to know. But there are a lot of things that are even outside of the Bible that verify it authenticates the Bible as well. One of those are the Apostolic Fathers, and when you study the Apostolic Fathers, and what I mean by that is, you, you know, first off, that you know, it's not a scriptural term by any means. We don't look in the Bible and say, look at the Apostolic Fathers. This is a term that kind of came about uh, after the first century, and uh, it's, you know, it's a term that just means, you know, some of these early writers. It refers to men who knew the apostles, or they knew others who knew them, and so a lot of these men were contemporaries of people like John. Uh, eventually, they'd be contemporaries of Peter like Paul and Peter and other men who were inspired of God. And uh, so it's very interesting when you start reading their accounts and their writings with, the you know, with these apostolic fathers. The first one was probably one of the most famous ones that, uh, you know, when we start looking at historically from the outside in, the way that Campbell looks at the outside, there's, you know, like a man like Clement of Rome. Clement of Rome uh, understood the organization of the church, and he wrote a lot about this. Uh, Rome, you know, Rome had its elders in the church, and Clement was one of them. And so he writes this account uh, to the to the church in Corinth, and in this account that he writes to them, there is no distinction between elders and bishops. In fact, um, and this is probably one of the earliest writings that they that they found after the inspired word. 
And so this is, you know, it's very valuable to find something like this and understand it. Even though he was not an inspired writer, he adds a lot of clarity to what the inspired writers were writing in these epistles uh, that were available for everyone. Um, he is, you know, he's actually found in the early canon of, you know, a lot of these uh, writers as well. And so, you know, at the time, you know, Clem Clement never claimed to be inspired, but at the time of Clement, there was no distinction, though, between bishops and elders. And so what's very interesting about this is we hear Paul talked, you know, in his letter to uh, Timothy, in his letter to Titus, he talks in a great length about the organization of the Church of Christ, and that every congregation was to have elders that were in place, but that these elders were to have certain qualifications, that not just anyone can serve in this capacity, but that they would have, you know, and it would be a plurality of elders. It wouldn't just be one man that was over everything. That's something that came later, and it would ultimately lead to a Catholic way of thinking, and then later on, you know, to other denominations and and false religions, uh, of course, den denominations are false. We don't see it in the New Testament, but it's. Uh, but at the time of Clement, he made no distinction between the bishops and the elders. Um, some of the elders were appointed by the apostles, and Clement would write about that. And so Clement was in the midst of plurality of elders. And when you read his, when, when you read his accounts, if you're able to get a hold of it. It's very interesting to see that he lived all the way back and saw everything kind of develop. He saw the church uh, in its progress and, you know, just kind of going through from the years and s seeing how people were responding to the gospel teaching. And he was actually one of those who really understood that, you know, of what the church was and that and how important it was to maintain that scriptural authority when it came to organization. Another person that uh, we, we read about in our history is Barnabas. Now, there's a work called the Epistle of Barnabas, and it's important to make note that this is not the Barnabas that was a, was a friend of Paul. Of course, we know that Paul had a friend named Barnabas that went on a lot of his journeys with him, uh, but this is not that particular Barnas, Barnabas. Barnabas, though, this, this Barnabas uh, argued that the law had been established and that it was no longer binding on Christians. Now that was big because you know Barnabas lives back in that first century and he understood that there was a fulfillment of that law. He calls it the an, an, an abolishment of that old law, but he understood that there was a new law that was under Christ that no longer and this is someone historically would have been a part of all of these things that the the apostles, the inspired writers would have wrote about. And so we're able to see someone else validate everything that Paul wrote about, everything that Peter wrote, everything that James wrote. The, the writer of Hebrews, you know, he, Barnabas corroborates all of this. And there's a ex great exhortation in the writings of Barnabas, in these letters of his, that, uh, regarding morals. And it was spot on with the morals that we are able to find in the Bible. And so we have a lot of these different men that are, you know, that, that are uh, shaping the way that we see the church through the years. They were the ones that would influence a lot of people later on, the way that Campbell would have had people uh, historically looking from the outside. And that's what we do when we're able to see these men and look at their writings. Is that, you know That's reasoning history from the outside in saying, okay, what did they write about? What did they believe and what did they see directly? And does it corroborate with what you know the scriptures say as well? Another man that we're able to look at is a man named Polycarp. Polycarp lives from 115 to about 156. Uh, he's probably best known as the uh, what they call the aged bishop of Smyrna. Uh, he was martyred for his faith. And, of course, there was a lot of persecution going on in that first century and, uh, and even beyond. And Polycarp was a, a very much a part of that. And he refused to bend on following the direction of the inspired word of God. And in fact, you know, when a lot of the people that were being persecuted, they would be asked straight up, if, you know, if they would be willing to renounce, even if they believed firmly on it, would they be willing to renounce uh, Christ and the Christian faith? Polycarp was one of those who said, I'm not going to do that. And he was put to death as well. And so we know a lot of these Apostolic Fathers, he, you know, he wrote a great deal about the first century and uh, the church and beyond in his writings as well. 
Not all of it is truthful, though. Not everything is uh, is you know is is spot on as far as truth and uh, authority goes. And the Didache is a good example of this. Now, the Didache uh, comes you know the Didache is is available from it took from 130 to about 150 being developed with that. Um, and it is sometimes called the twelve, uh, the teachings of the 12 apostles. Now, there are some good things that came out of the didache, but there's also some things that were not so truthful as well. Um, one of the things that was true, and again, this is, you know, this was very big in that first century and beyond because, we, you know, still we have got one church that was established and there was one organization to it. And the didache did not make any distinction between elders and bishops. And so again, this was, you know, church organization was very important when the church was starting to, you know, to, to get people to understand that there had to be a plurality of elders or bishops. Uh, it's, you know, it's the same office as we read about in the New Testament. And the Didache made mention of, you know, of those elders and, you know, plurality of church leaders. That is so important. And as we, you know, as we look for new elders in this congregation. As other congregations look for new elders and establish those leaders, we need to make sure that they are faithful men and they fit those qualifications. Uh, we need to be fair. I mean, we need to, you know, I mean, they are human still, and uh, we certainly want to encourage them and lift them up and just, you know, try to, you know, try to get behind them for whatever, whatever the reason and. Uh, and for whatever decision comes about that they have to make. They have to make some tough calls sometimes. But they are to be faithful men, and they're, they're a very serious set of guidelines if someone wants to become an elder. Now, what the didache fell short on, though, is that they taught to, they taught to baptize in living water, and that it had to be you know living, running water, and that if you don't have any well, then you can just find something else. But that it had to be, you know, lit, that it should be, you know, this running, living water with that. Okay, that's not a that that's not a, a true statement. Uh, we don't find that in the pages of the New Testament. We find some examples of it. We know that Jesus was uh, baptized in the Jordan River, but to you know to hold that down as a command is something else. And we have a great example of this uh, when we look at Acts chapter two. You know, when you look at um, these Jews. From you know, from all of these different places, and they said there could have been upwards of you know a few million people from these fourteen different places that we see in Acts chapter two. Well, they come to Jerusalem, and in Jerusalem, uh, you know, there's uh, what they call the Temple Mount, and it would have been the temple at that time in Jerusalem, and it is a huge structure. You know, if you've seen a picture of this, it is. You know, people always ask, well, how can that many people come to one place? You know, you know to, and, and what was it like? What was the environment? And what was the setting and the atmosphere? And, and if you've seen the picture of that temple, it is impressive. And so imagine all of these people, these Jews, coming to, Pente coming to Jerusalem for Pentecost with, with the same mind, the same faith, all for the same purpose, and 3,000 people based upon the preaching of Peter and the other apostles, the ones who were so affected that they ask, you know, what should we do? And they said, repent and be baptized. Now, a lot of critics say, well, how can 3,000 people be baptized? Where was it? You know, Jerusalem wasn't right, you know, it wasn't near a body of water. It wasn't near a running uh, running river. It was, you know, Jerusalem's landlocked. And so how in the world can 3,000 people be baptized in a place like that? Well, if you look at the temple uh, what you're looking at here is a picture of wh what they call a mikvah, and it's a it's a baptismal place. It's a you know a body of water, a standing body of water, and at this temple uh, at that time, I believe that uh, history tells us that there was over 130 of these dip of these different pools, and so it would have been very feasible for 3,000 people to be baptized in one day. And you know, you imagine getting you know all of these people around, and you know the the apostles are there, and as they baptize people, those people could feasibly baptize other people. And you know, but they had all of these different pools around the temple, and so they very well could have baptized them all at one time. And so we see that example at Pentecost that it does not have to be necessarily running water. It doesn't matter what kind of water we're baptized in. We don't, have, you know, that's not part of a command. Peter said, 
repent and be baptized. He didn't say where to be baptized. We know that the uh, eunuch went down into a body of water and he was baptized there. We know that there, you know, based on other accounts in Scripture, you know, with baptism and understanding baptism is essential for salvation. Uh, there were different bodies of water that people would be baptized. Today we have different bodies of water, and you know the the method that you know the way to go down into that water that is the you know that is the crux of what God wanted us to know and what He wanted us to do. And so the water we're not given the specific command of what kind of water it was. The Didache also taught on uh, you know clinical baptism later on and, uh, in 1311. It actually adopted uh, the sprinkling for uh, infants with you know, for infant baptism, and so you know while it was not on par on you know while it was not uh, on point with everything. It still you know there were some things that were very valid with you know what it would teach regarding church organization as well. Uh, a man named Papias. Papias comes and he you know he, one of the things that. Uh, you know, and another uh, again. You know, we need to be careful because sometimes they weren't always on point. They were, uh, they weren't always truthful with what they taught. There was error that was in such as the case with Papias. Uh, Papias served as the bishop of the church. He claimed Matthew was written in Hebrew. Of course, we don't have any evidence of this, and um, it may have been translated in Hebrew, but it wasn't written originally in Hebrew. Well, one of the things with Papias is that uh, a man named Eusebius gives him credit for his millennial views. And so Papias has these millennial, you know, premillennials and believing Christ is going to literally come down to the earth and walk on the earth. Of course, we don't see that in Scripture. Uh, there's nowhere, anywhere in the New Testament that says Christ is physically going to set foot on the earth again. And we have the uh, shepherd of Hermas, who became, a, you know, he was, this was a well-to-do farmer and... This uh, he was a he was a slave at his time. Um, you know, a, a lot of misfortune would ultimately take his money, which caused him to turn to God. And so, you know, he starts questioning some different things. One of the things he questioned during his time and within his writings is whether or not forgiveness of sin is committed after baptism. And of course, we know that repentance is available to us after baptism as well. When you look at Acts chapter eight and verse twenty-two. Uh, Luke writes, Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. And we know that Simon was baptized. And so, you know, we do have these examples that after we, you know, after we are we become a Christian, we can still be baptized. And so we have all of these different things that the apostolic fathers that are, you know, that to help us historically understand from the outside in the way that Campbell was reasoning, we can reason it as well and get all of this. There's also the uh, evidence of the apologists. And, you know, apologists is just simply, or, you know, when, when someone talks about uh, uh, Christian apologetics, it's a, just a written defense of Christian authority is what that means. And we have a lot of different people. I want to make mention of a few here that really are uh, significant value when you look at the first century uh, especially. You know, there's been some great apologists over the years and some great works that have come around, and but there were also those first century apologists that, you know, defended Christianity. Remember that first, you know, in that first century, Nero, uh, he burns Rome down and he starts to blame the Christians and he tries to get them in trouble with everyone. And uh, it caused Christians to have to meet in secret because they were being persecuted. They're being scattered. Everyone wanted to wanted to kill them, ultimately, because they thought that it was the Christians who were burning everything down. And so they had to retreat into caves, uh, into catacombs, wherever they could find uh, safety uh, for it. And so rumors spread, you know, about Christians and uh, some, you know, some horrible falsified rumors about it that, you know, they were called cannibals at one time because, you know, they, with the Lord's Supper, how you know, they would, when they would eat the body, you know, the bread representing the body and drink the fruit of the vine, which represented the blood um, of Christ, you know, people would call them cannibals for this reason. Um, the Roman government, you know, might have just been jealous of them. I mean, that's, you know, Christianity, if you think about this in the first century, it spread like wildfire. And the Roman government became very critical of it and very paranoid by it. But in, defend, in defending themselves, they wrote a lot of these apologetics, these apologies with it, these defenses of it. 
and uh, the writings were explained through origin and through doctrine, through worship. And it comes, you know, we come to these seven early apologists. None of them were inspired writers, but all of them historically were able to give us so much value in proving God, proving Christ, proving the church, and what it, you know, what it was. Uh, the first one I want to look at is a man named Quadratus. Quadratus was one of the very first defenses of the church of Christ. Uh, he wrote how Jesus cured people and raised them from the dead. In fact, Quadratus, through his writings, even went so far as to uh, write about people that he knew and that he talked to who had actually been a part of that miracle. I always get really uh, interested in, you know, when we see someone that was healed from leprosy or his sight was uh, given back to him or someone who was even raised from the dead and how they must have responded, how people responded to them. We really don't get a lot of dialogue in the Bible. We do in a few uh, circumstances, but really not a lot. And Quadratus was one that, you know, said he had actually seen these miracles happen and he writes about it. And so we're able to see through his apologetics and his writings of talking to people who were raised from the dead through and healed through these different miracles in that first century. What value that adds to, you know, to looking at something and, and authenticating it. We look, another, another one that we can look at is uh, Aristides. He was the first, he wrote the first complete document in defense of Christianity in that first century. Another one was Justin Martyr, or Justin the Martyr. Martyr uh, Justin was a uh, philosopher in his day, and he could not, but he couldn't find the satisfaction in philosophy. He meets a Christian at Ephesus, and through this process, this relationship, he ends up becoming a Christian. Um, he wrote he wrote an apology uh, as far you know defense of Christian uh, Christianity. And uh, he writes this um, dialogue that he had with someone named Trifo. Uh, he also writes about you know the, um, greeting people with a holy kiss, which he would do, uh, meeting on Sunday, the Lord's Day. Uh, he wrote about baptism for the remission of sins. Uh, he wrote about how baptism was immersion. He understood the, the, the transliteration of that word and he, that it was uh, unto regeneration. He wrote about the Lord's Supper and that it had to be taken on the first day of the week in order to show favor to the Christ. And so it's uh, you know he had a lot to offer in in the way of his writings in defending the Christian faith. Tatian comes along and he writes uh, something called the, the the address to the Greeks and he would ridicule their pretension, you know, with the, with the Greek philosophy and so forth. And he said he would he said in his writings that Christianity held a higher place, a higher position than all of these, you know, these Greek uh, ideas that came along. And you know, we we should never ever think of ourselves as superior. You know, we we know that sometimes the Jews did that in in the Old Testament. Um, there was a lot of religious elitism in the New Testament by ways of the Pharisees, and we want to make sure that as Christians, we never elevate ourselves above what we deserve. We are only who we are because Christ went to that cross for us, and we never, never deserve to be like that. But nonetheless, Titian comes along and he writes about how Christians hold uh, you know, a higher position than you know, a lot of other people in the religious kingdom. Um, and then we have uh, Melito. Melito was a bishop from Sardis. He wrote, he wrote about the Lord's Day. He writes about baptism. Uh, he writes, um, you know, he shows the, in his writings, he shows the emperor that the church is a positive force. And so he did a lot of defending of it. Uh, he showed how Christianity was a revelation from God. And then you have um, Athenagoras, uh, who wrote the supplication for the Christians? He wrote a piece called on the uh, or, or a piece about the resurrection of the dead, and so all of these. You you know you look at all of these different things added one you know after another. Theophilus, who you know deals with the existence of God, he quotes from the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, he said that they were inspired by one Spirit of God in Christ, and so you know all these all these different works added, really you know to the authentic the the. Uh, the authentic value, the historical value of the Christian faith. And we have this, and we're able to look at this historically from the outside in. That is the very reason that Campbell 
taught the way that he did is that he believed that you did not have to be there in order to know that it occurred, that we have all of these different ways. And that's how he would teach. You know, he was being influenced by all of these different individuals on, and, and they helped shape who he was. And he would in turn help shape you know, what other people would. And he understood just the significance of everything. And that's why when we look back at all of these different things, there are, you know, they, there are people that are in our lives that really help us. They, you know, they help us grow. They help us mature. And reading things like this can really help in our understanding and our appreciation of New Testament Christianity and knowing what happened back then and what they were going through and why, you know, and, and the, the development of Christianity through the years. There's a couple of other names that are on this list that influenced Campbell. Uh, one was a man named Francis Bacon. Francis Bacon had ideas about uh, inductive reasoning, and that greatly influenced Campbell. In fact, that's a great under you know to understand that inductive reasoning really helps in the way of debate because it's you know taking everything in, and as you take it in, you start to reason it, and you just want more and more evidence to uh, to help shape a a belief or a teaching. And uh, or you know, in, in the way of debate, a proposition, and getting your point across. Uh, Bacon believed that the universe operated under a strong, unchanging, and unchangeable laws. That God installs these laws, in, you know, for the universe, and that it, you know, that because of these, it would just, uh, you know, that it uh, it operated under these, you know, these great laws that God would give. Uh, he also taught that in order to have a happy life, that you need to follow the laws of nature. You know, life is an endless search to follow these laws. He, and so he would deal a lot with rationalism. And, you know, and of course, God was at the center of all of this. Um, it was Campbell who would later say, you know, based on the teachings of Bacon, Campbell said that script, you know, of Scripture that there are unchangeable laws and that we have to follow them. That there are laws in place that God has set, and there's nothing that we can do outside of what those laws are. There's no flexibility whatsoever. And finally, there's a man named Matthias Luz, and Luz probably had one of the greatest impacts on Campbell. Uh, he was the one who ultimately would baptize Alexander Campbell on Wednesday, June the 12th, 1812. And so, you know, we are certainly grateful for the ones who would sit and they would study with us and they would help us understand and get a, a greater knowledge of biblical teaching to the point where we would make that ultimate decision, the greatest decision that we could ever make, and that is baptism. We owe a debt of gratitude to so many people that have helped us along the way. And of course, you know, nothing would be where it is without the revealed Word of God. Well, through this... Um, Campbell, remember, as I, I mentioned in the last lesson, never really broke ties with the Baptist Church. Um, he would, you know, he set up the Redstone Association that was uh, affiliated with the Baptists, and he was uh, associated himself with the Brush Run Church, which joined the uh, Redstone Association. But it was on a condition that they would not lose their autonomy. That was something that was very important to Campbell, and it was something that was very important to a lot of these different restoration preachers or the preachers of that movement and that you know each congregation would have its autonomy that they you know they didn't believe in one big governing body and the baptists of course would ultimately develop that in into uh, the baptist convention and uh, but campbell was very careful about not letting that autonomy go and so while he was still connected to the baptist church he would say okay there are conditions or contingencies on doing this. And that would lead him to ultimately set up a uh, the Buffalo Seminary in his home. And so these are the uh, influences that, you know, that really kind of shaped Alexander Campbell, that helped him, you know, and helped his work. Uh, we see a lot of his ideas coming about from these different uh, influences, these different men and what they would teach. And of course, he didn't take it to the full extent of each one of these individuals, but he, you know, but each one of them had something to do with the way that he would think and the way that he would try to reason with other people. How grateful we are to those who have helped us along the way to help us understand. And if we're wrong about something, to help you know look at New Testament scripture 
and help uh, get us on the right track and, and help correct us. Many of the teachings that we receive, many of the teachings that he received was correction. And we're certainly grateful because that is what the gospel is designed to do. It's not just designed to rebuke. And, you know, remember what Paul wrote to Timothy, 2 Timothy 4, 2, to reprove, rebuke, and exhort. Reproving means to correct. And sometimes we need to do that, but we also need to remember to encourage. That's what he tried to do, and that's what we need to try to do as well. Next class, we're going to be looking at uh, the, you know, how Alexander Campbell, now that he has been influenced by all of these people, how, you know, what he did to take it to the next stage, how he influenced others, and how many of these preachers of the Restoration Movement would would uh, ultimately influence other people as well, and just how this you know, and we're gonna we're gonna we're almost to the end of this, and we're gonna just so we're just gonna kind of look at all of the work that they would collectively do in the same cause, different places. Uh, some of them didn't know each other, but still ultimately look at what they were working towards, and that is to get people back on track with New Testament thinking. Again, thank you very much for being with us. And if you have any prayers, please let us know so that we can be sure to pray with you and sit down and look at New Testament thinking and, you know, the way, you know, and ask, what does the Bible have to say about all these different matters?